It's too late to stop global warming. There's nothing we can do now that will pre prevent the planet from heating up. What we can do is influence how much heating takes place. The world needs to care about what's going on with global warming because now it's not about just a country, it's about the world and who's gonna, who's gonna step up, who's gonna be the, the leader in this, going into this new era. Energy is not something that most people think about. It's not something that most people care about, but if they didn't have it, life as we know it would cease to exist. The direct connection between each and every one of us and global warming is energy. The way that we choose and use energy. And it's not gonna happen in 30 years. It's not gonna happen when our children are turning like 50 or something. It's not gonna happen like in a hundred years, but it's happening like right this second. If we don't do something now, we're good as dead. A, a huge problem is that not everybody, they know what's happening, but they don't know how to solve it. So they expect other people to solve it for them. And they expect them to say, well, we did this and this is how we solved it because they don't know how to do it. So they're relying on everyone else. But meanwhile, everyone else is relying on them. So if that's the case, then you're really not going to get anywhere. Kids can do so many things, but they can't just do it alone. They need to convince their parents. Parents, parents they feel that they don't have that same threat. They won't be there when the world is so polluted that we all die. They all have already died of natural causes. And some people might argue, oh, those environmentalists are extreme, but what if those environmentalists were their children? What would they say then? What would happen if those environmentalists did turn out to be correct? I, what would happen then? They'd have no recourse. Um, so I kind of know I sound like a broken record now, but better be safe than sorry. Global warming is the most serious threat we as a species have ever faced. We keep hearing that, but what exactly is global warming? Global warming is the increase in temperature worldwide caused by greenhouse gases trapping the radiation from the sun inside Earth's atmosphere instead of bouncing off. This increase in temperature is not a harmless fact of nature. These greenhouse gases that are making our planet heat up faster and faster are caused by us. We are disrupting the balance. Every time you turn on a light, turn on your car, listen to music, or turn on the air conditioning, you are causing some hundred more pounds of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to trap more heat in our Earth. In order to create electricity and other power, you must burn coal or gas or oil or even ethanol, which pollutes our atmosphere and seals more heat in Earth. Why should you care? Global warming affects not only the earth and the animals, but also the people. There has been a drastic increase in storms due to global warming. Japan has set records in typhoon ferocity and numbers, displacing thousands and killing hundreds as well. Even here in America, we have set records in the number of hurricanes and tornadoes, displacing thousands more, as well as killing hundreds. But it doesn't have to be this way. This doesn't have to be the inevitable course of events. There are alternatives to fossil fuels, alternative energies that don't pollute and have drastically reduced impacts on our environment. These types of energies can also be called renewable because their sources are virtually unlimited. Alternate energy will not hurt the economy. People think that huge star people help eventually. But that big word eventually is what people fear. They're, to buy a solar panel, that costs a lot more than a light bulb. But people don't realize when you have that solar power, you have free energy for the rest of your life.
Solar, like many of the other sustainable technologies, um, doesn't produce pollution. Secondly, it goes on forever. I mean, the, the majority of our energy supply only lasts as long as we can get fuel, and once the fuel supply dries up, our energy supply dries up. That's not true with solar. Again, as long as the sun keeps shining, you're going to be able to keep producing electricity. So it's clean and it's renewable because it doesn't depend on a finite resource. And then solar has two additional advantages. One is that it's peaking capacity, which means solar produces the most energy when you most need it, which is those hot sunny afternoons when everybody turns their air conditioner on. That's when the, the grid is at its most stressed peak, and that's also when solar is producing the most. Uh, and then secondly, it's distributed, which means you're putting these solar systems embedded out in the uh, the grid where the energy is used. So you're producing the energy very close to where you use it. So how does solar work? Well, we start at the sun, the source of all life on Earth. 93 million miles away, the sun emits light, light which is, in essence, pure energy. Eight minutes later, when it arrives on Earth, it bounces right off the surface, unless, of course, it hits a solar panel. A solar panel absorbs the energy of the light and converts it to electricity that we can use without emitting one particle of CO2. When you look at it, it really is this simple. You can't put a coal or oil-fired power plant on your roof, but you can put a solar panel. This means that you can put solar panels almost anywhere. I do this little experiment myself when I drive around New Jersey and I notice all of the transmission lines that you know I never noticed before I was in the solar world but now I notice them all over the place and I think well what if we just you know under all these transmission lines what if we just put solar panels under the transmission lines so we already are you know we already have this infrastructure dedicated to energy why don't we just complement it with solar PV uh, what a difference that would make when people want these solar panels when people realize this there's going to be need for more production, which means more supply. The price will go down. Instead of a $10,000 solar panel, you might be able to get 20 for $10,000, one for 500. When people start buying these things, price goes down. It's only just that solar panels are so new to most people, that not many people are willing to buy them. You know, I'm happy to point out over here the solar panels that we got installed about two years ago, and here they are over here. They look kind of modern uh, and all, but, you know, to me they look like works of art and quite in place for, you know, this here, you know, hot rural setting, you know, though we also have, you know, this high tech aspect you know, to it. Call in addition to humans that, you know, look at them, admire them. Uh, I also will say that, you know, our cows that we have here on the farm like them also, you know, in that, you know, they come up here and graze on the grass and everything like that. And when they get hot, they go behind the panels to cool off. And a lot of times we get these Kodak moments where here's all these cows sitting underneath them, you know, loving the shade. Atlantic City, land of slots and poker chips, the last place you'd expect to see renewable energy in action, but just beyond the glow of the neon lights, you'll see the ACUA. This facility, the Waste Management Center of Atlantic County, has taken every possible measure to establish itself a paragon of what it means to go green with renewable energy. At their landfill, you'll find methane gas being captured and burned for electricity. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas that is produced when garbage decomposes, so it's very important to collect it and control it. If you're going through that trouble, why not burn it and make some electricity? And that's what they do. They use biofuels, that's fuel made from vegetable oil and animal fat, to power their fleet of 106 cars and trucks. They have a massive recycling center that has processed around a billion pounds of plastic, glass, cans, paper, and cardboard since its construction. They have pipes that go deep underground to use the heat of the earth to heat and cool their administrative building. This is called geothermal energy. And then they have one of the largest solar arrays in the state. 
2,700 panels, generating enough power for 62 homes. But what's most impressive are their wind turbines. So each one of them is about 1.5 megawatts. Uh, they sit 261 feet in the air to the nose of it. Uh, they're fully automatic. I mean, they, they will turn. If the wind direction here turns, the top part will turn also. Ah. They, they all come from different places. The towers came from Montreal. The uh, blades were in West Virginia. The nose cones in Florida and the nacelle was in Texas. They've been available, which means like even that one's available right now. 99% uh, of the time, 98% wow. of the time. This one here is a little slow. It's not, it's only at like 92% available. But um, as far as wind condition goes, they've been running practically flat out. So we're gonna save this year roughly, it's ex expected, $1,000 a day, $365,000 this calendar year. That will increase over time as electric rates uh, go up. But solar and wind aren't the only options. There are new and promising technologies emerging that prove that when it comes to renewable energy, the journey is just beginning. One place is on Roosevelt Island in the heart of New York City, where they found a different use for the turbines. Uh, what we have here in New York City is uh, an attempt an early attempt to create a new industry and a new type of renewable energy technology which generates electricity from the flow of water. So we have here the first project of its kind in the world that has delivered electricity to customers here on Roosevelt Island in New York City. Uh, it's much like windmills except it's underwater. So uh, like when the wind blows and the windmills turn, when the water flows, rapidly our turbines under the water turn and generate electricity for a supermarket here on Roosevelt Island and a parking garage. The flow of the tides is entirely predictable for centuries. So we can tell an electric utility when the electricity is going to be available to them unlike solar and wind currently. There are also great flows of water in various places in the oceans around the world the Bay of Fundy, the Gulf Stream, other places that eventually these technologies can be deployed and generate massive amounts of electricity for distribution and transmission to larger populations. When you think about energy overall, there's really two problems. Where does our electricity come from and how do we fuel our vehicles? And they're both sort of equal, um, uh, equal contributors to uh, global warming, for example. They both generate about half of the, the carbon dioxide that we need to deal with. It's astonishing that almost all of our transportation comes exclusively from petroleum. So our whole way of life depends in a, in a fundamental way on cheap transportation, and yet that whole infrastructure is dependent on a single fuel supply. This, as you can see, is a um, gasoline, originally a gasoline car made by Ford, the Ford Escort. This was uh, considered to be a good car to convert to electric. So the first step in converting the car to electric was to take out the gasoline engine, which is under the hood. And this little thing here is the electric motor that replaced the internal combustion engine. 
This one in particular is a two-seater. And that's because if you look where the back seat was, where this wheel was, we've placed batteries in there. And uh, we gave up space for passengers to put in enough batteries to give this vehicle the range, the range that we wanted it to have. By range, this vehicle could do, uh, has done over 100 miles on a single charge. All electric cars basically have an electric motor as their, their principal uh, driving force. And in this case, it's a battery electric car in the sense that the motor gets its energy from batteries that are on board and that you charge up by plugging it in at night. And we only charge a car when the batteries are dead because that can actually help um, have the batteries hold a longer charge. So all you do, you plug it in and then all you have to do is flip the switch and it runs, that's it. And then the energy from the sun to the solar panel takes it off the grid and that's it. The energy conversion that occurs to make the car go is the application of electric power into a, a motor is the answer for the future. We're, we're an inner city, urban, comprehensive high school. And you know, you, you've talked to us, we're not geniuses, we're, we're just people that have found ourselves in this area. And we're developing cars like this one uh, on a shoestring budget that gets over 60 miles to the gallon and is extremely fast. Now you can't tell me that GM or Honda or any one of those folks could have done that and done it better. Well, it sells itself pretty much. I mean, just the look of it. People are attracted to it by the way it looks. But once like they find out that it was built by a high school, I think that pretty much drills them in more. And like I just start telling like details about the car. Like it gets over 60 miles to the gallon. And they pretty much find it hard to believe that a high school did that. I don't understand why someone wouldn't want to buy a hybrid car. Probably because people aren't aware of the dangers of air pollution. They aren't aware of what their what a regular gas engine car is doing to the to the environment. And some people they probably do know, they just don't care. But people really need to realize that it's it's more important than it sounds. It's like driving a hybrid car, it's like changing the world. In all this talk about technology, one of the things you might be surprised to hear is that our problem of global warming and energy is directly related to the food we eat, or rather, where our food comes from. There's an interesting concept out there right now being talked about. It's called food miles. What is a food mile? Well, it's, it's how far your food has to travel to get to your plate. So let's take the breadbasket of the United States. It's in the West. It's called the Imperial Valley. It runs from north of San Francisco to south of Los Angeles. And it's where, all your, where most of your vegetables come from. Now, if you live in New York City, and it comes from Salinas, California, which is the vegetable capital of the Imperial Valley, just north of Los Angeles, your food has traveled about 3,000 miles. And how did it get here? It didn't fly on its own. <laughs> it had to be either shipped by truck, by train, certainly not by boat, and sometimes by airplane. Now, all of those devices require fossil fuel. Farmers markets are great energy conservers because they are bringing locally grown food to the table. They are shortening the distance from the field to the table. And this has incredibly large implications. This is one of the largest energy users. We, we have a food system in America that is not only extremely energy intensive, it's also a, a fragile system that is not very self-reliant. So the key to all of this is locally grown food and farmers markets are a great solution to the problem. But as our population continues to grow, we will start to run out of land and we will need to look to renewable energy and innovation for the answer. That's where the vertical farm steps in. Okay, um, our project is a vertical farm. Now you're probably wondering what a vertical farm is. We came up with a definition that it is a self-sustaining farm inside a building used to produce crops and reuse everything it emits. 
We made a pros and cons chart to see how effective this building would be if we put it into cities, and we came up with all pros and no cons. The Vertical Farm is a multi-story greenhouse. It is completely carbon neutral. It captures sunlight to heat itself. It burns coal to power itself. The CO2 released by the coal burning is recaptured by the plants. If you want, you can put wind and solar on the roof. It even recycles all unused plant matter for fuel, which is a process known as biomass. This is the larger model of the biomass room that Sophia mentioned. Um, and this is the process uh, in which to make biomass energy. The inedible crops, like um, corn husks or rotten vegetables, go down this uh, chute onto the conveyor belt. And they're brought along into this first tank, which cooks the plant matter. Then in the second tank, the plant matter is crushed into a powder. And in here, it's compressed into clean burning biomass pellets. Then in here, the biomass pellets are burned to, to boil this water, which makes steam, which makes the turbine spin, creating energy. Then this black thing back here, which is the tube, sends the energy all throughout the biomass, uh, all throughout the uh, farm and the surrounding city. With vertical farming, you've got the ability to put a farm right in the middle of the city. That's next door to where you live. The beauty of that is that you can watch your food being made, you can go pick it if you want, and you can eat it and it's fresh, and there's no fertilizers, there's no herbicides, and there's no pesticides. It's totally organic. Not too many decades from now, maybe only a couple decades from now, the next generation will ask, I promise you this, they will ask one of two questions. They'll look back on 2007 here at the beginning of the 21st century and they'll read whatever the history books have in there about uh, the scientific consensus. It's the firmest scientific consensus on practically anything except maybe gravity. And if there was money to be made in denying the reality of gravity, you'd have a lot of people out there paying think tanks to say gravity doesn't exist. But the consensus is real. And years from now, they'll look back and they'll ask one of two questions. Either they will ask, what in the world were they thinking? How could they have sat on their hands and done nothing when the scientific consensus was overwhelming and when the stakes were so high? How could they have done this to us? Didn't they care? Were they too uh, distracted by greed or short-term measures or whatever? Didn't they care? Couldn't they hear? Couldn't they see? Couldn't they understand? Or they'll ask another question, and the one I want them to ask is this. How did they get their act together? How did they find the uncommon moral courage to come together and rise to meet a moral challenge that so many said was impossible to solve? That is the question we have to provide the answer to now with our actions, not just our promises. Thank you, New Jersey, for leading the way. Everyone should think about the place they love most, whether it be like the desert, the beach, mountains, anything. And they have to realize that if we don't stop global warming really soon, like right now, those places aren't going to be there anymore. Um, every little bit helps. Somebody may think, oh, me just doing this or me just recycling, and that won't really help global warming, but every little bit counts. And if, if a million people did that, or, then it would be a great improvement to the, pro to the problem we have now, but if a million people said, oh, somebody else will do it, then that won't be helping at all. Global warming, it's not that, it's not like it's, it's doing good to our planet, that's a bad thing, but well, the good thing is like you can unite the, unite the entire, like the world to just think, oh we have to work together on this, and like after we do that, after we do that, we'll all be like friends and stuff. Uh, you know, we have the lights, we have the computers, we have the vending machines, we have the cars, we're the ones driving them. It's not some, somebody in Washington. Uh, we make individual decisions. Thousands, we make hundreds of them in the course of a day. 
we need to be able to make choices that improve things. And that's what this is really about. This tool right here is one of the most important technological tools that there is, which is the index finger, to be able to turn off things that we're not using. I don't want you to keep things off when you want them. I'm saying when you don't use them. There's no reason to have lights on two rooms away. Maybe you want a light on in the next room because it makes you feel secure. You're not wasting anything. You're using that light because it means something to you. But to have lights on in other rooms that you have no contact with, turn them off. Save a watt. Save some money. Save some carbon dioxide. Reduce your impact on the, on the, on the climate and, uh, and do the right thing.